Thank you. All right. Hey, everybody. Sorry. Happy warm uh, day in June, right? I mean, hasn't it been a freaking cold winter? Way too long. I've been freezing all winter. I mean, I just love it that I can wear something that's short sleeved and, and all of that, even in San Francisco here. So, um, so I want to talk about the future of food here and where it's going. How many of you here think that the future is vegan? <laughs> Woo! Okay, let me see if I can get this to work. Well, that's because you guys are all vegan, and so of course you're going to think that, right? But what do non-vegans think about the future of food? How many of you think that non-vegans think it's not ever going to happen? Like, how many times have you had that conversation with that ornery person at a potluck? It's like, well, that's never going to happen, right? So I was just at this protein technology summit last week in Chicago where I was on this panel. And this is not your, you know, homegrown veg fest or even a CalCon. This is an event for food technologists, food scientists, people in the industry, investors, um, you know, you name it, the big name companies, ConAgra, all those kinds of companies were there. And every speaker talking about protein, Okay, a few mentioned insects, but predominantly they were all talking about vegan, about plant-based. Now, one speaker took a poll, you know, asked for hands to be shown. How many here are flexitarians trying to reduce meat? How many are, are vegetarian? And, and, you know, when they, she asked about trying to reduce meat, I would say two-thirds of the hands went up. When she finally asked how many vegans there were in the audience, how many hands do you think went up? One. Guess whose hand it was? Mine. Right. That's okay. So we're talking about a summit where there is not a single vegan except for moi, and yet everyone was talking about plant-based as being inevitable. And they were all saying, hey guys, this is what we have to invest in because there is no other future. They all recognize the need for innovation. They all recognize that the other alternative, that is, the incumbent agricultural uh, industry is no longer sustainable. So these are the people that are driving innovation, that are driving the industry. Often I think about, you know, what is the best form of activism? What do you guys think? Do you think it's holding picket signs? Is it going into a restaurant and screaming at patrons because they're eating flesh? Uh, you know, or is it maybe making those delicious brownies that you take next door to your neighbor and they're like, oh my God, this is vegan? Is that a form of activism? You think that works? And, and this is what we're talking about. This is the kind of innovation we're talking about. How many times have you been to a potluck or something and someone goes like, ah, yeah, I feel sorry for you vegans. You guys are so limited. You can't eat anything. And, and what do you say? Do you, do you like go into defensive mode? Do you start apologizing for, for what you eat? Or do you start attacking that person because they're wrong? How about we stop talking about how limited we are and defending ourselves and feeling like, you know, how about if we start talking about solutions and possibilities and it's like, oh my God, you mean you're not vegan? Oh my God, you are missing out. I can't tell you. How fantastic, how phenomenal it is to be vegan. You know what, if you're not there yet, it's okay, you'll get there. I'll help you get there. It's so delicious, you wouldn't imagine the possibilities and flavors. I mean, we've gotta show the world how phenomenal it is to be vegan. That's why I got myself a tattoo. All right, we're talking about solutions. We need to talk about solutions. We, as vegans, we're going around telling everybody how bad it is in animal agriculture, how much suffering there is, how much pain there is. It's simply overwhelming. It's, I have three kids. I don't know how many of you guys have kids out there, but it never worked when I said to them, no, no, you can't do that, and then walked away. Every time I said no, I had to say, you know, you can't do this, but how about we do this? You have to find solutions. And so the best form of activism is one that combines the display of the problem with the solution. And that's where industry comes in. That's where innovation comes in. Because as they say, you know, the way to a, a cow's heart is through her stomach. 
And if I want my cows on my sanctuary to come home, I can't just say, hey, come on, Erica, come on. Uh, come on, come on, Angel, let's go in for the night. I gotta show them a little treat. And that's what we have to do. We have to lead people to this phenomenal lifestyle. Now, I was a vegan years ago. You know, I've been vegan for 30 years or so. And it was back in the dog ages. I mean, there were no cow cons. I mean, there was no vegan bubble where you felt safe and protected and all this delicious food. You know, the food was all kind of brown and kind of gross. And, and when you met another vegan, it was almost like, you know, because I, I always thought I was like the only normal vegan in the world. And so when I met another vegan, I thought, he's got to be strange. And that's kind of what it was. Like, even vegans thought other vegans were strange. You know? So, I mean, we've really come a long ways. <laughs> so when I went vegan, I had to figure out not only how am I going to eat delicious food, but I made it my life's mission to preach, to, act, to be an activist through food, through showing people the solutions for making a change in their lives that could impact the entire world. And I think that answer is deliciousness. That's what people want. And that's what we're going to talk about today are the trends <clears throat> that became so apparent at that protein technology summit about how we're headed into a vegan future and all the exciting innovation and investments that are going into this space. So this is what we have now. We are now entering a renaissance. We've left the dark ages, and now you can have delicious vegan cheese. In fact, I was just at Wegmans, which is a supermarket, this amazing supermarket chain on the East Coast. They had three freaking doors of vegan cheese, including ours. Do you believe this? This is what the world is coming to. It is a bright, wonderful future. Now I want to talk about some of the trends um, among consumers in the industry. Now there was a study done by Matson, which is this uh, food technology, food innovation uh, company. Uh, they develop a lot of products and they did this test of, you know, they wanted to find out should we be using the word plant-based or vegan and how much interest is there in plant-based. And their study basically you know, revealed exactly what I heard at the Protein Technology Summit, which is that there's a huge percentage of people uh, that are turning flexitarian, and these are the drivers. These are who I call the pre-vegans, or the trans-vegans, or whatever you want to call it. But they're an opportunity for you to target. So get that. Make sure you know who you're talking to. You want to you want to hit up those flexitarians up there. Now, according to their study, vegans were only 2% of the population, although another study actually showed that it was 6%. And then a yet another study showed that a combination of vegans and vegetarians is now at about 10% in this country. So it's increasing rapidly. When people were asked to choose between the word plant-based and vegan, it was overwhelmingly, in the general public, skew towards plant-based. And some of you may have seen this uh, actually in, in some of the vegan blogs that have been coming out in the last week or two. And it turns out that a lot of people still feel that vegan is a word that has a lot of baggage. And why is that? Um, so there's a little bit, you know, they think that plant-based is really just a dietary choice and vegan is really a lifestyle choice and it's a little bit old school and that's because well, are we going to be vegan ambassadors or vegan police? Now, who is this guy? This guy is Derek Sarno. And he is, what he's doing is changing the perception of veganism in the UK. He's been hired by Tesco to develop a whole line of ready-to-eat plant-based meals that are now being sold in thousands of stores in the UK. Do you think he does more for veganism or the vegan police? Who are we going to be? We can decide what form of activism we choose to do ourselves. And I really believe that the answer is in providing solutions to people rather than bashing people on the head because they're not vegan enough. All right, so here's some more um, stats here. Um, you know, there's only a very, very small percentage of people that say they'll never go vegan. The majority are really you know, over half the population wants to eat more plant-based foods. And if you look at it, 81 per 31% of Americans practice plant-free 
free days, uh, meat free days, and 81% of millennials are now purchasing plant-based proteins. So this is absolutely huge. It's a movement that cannot be stopped. But why is everyone switching? Is it because they care about animals? It's generally because they care about their own health. We're still in a me-centric era where we think about ourselves the most. And we've got to change that. We've got to change the perception so people start thinking globally, start thinking beyond themselves, start thinking about each individual as a part of a larger whole so that we can move towards a vegan future which isn't just about animals. It's about becoming better human beings. It's about how we evolve into our own humanity. What does the word humane mean? How are we truly human if we're not truly humane as individuals? And so veganism is a movement not only towards a plant-based diet or our own health or saving animals, but be about becoming better human beings. So people care mostly about health and they only care about eating that healthy food if it tastes absolutely delicious. So if you make something that's really, really killer and it's got tons of, you know, the macronutrient that most people care about, which is protein, and maybe it's got some omega-3s and whatever, but it tastes like crap, it still will not sell. And people will decide, well, okay, I'm not gonna be healthy today, I'm gonna eat that junk food. And so we've gotta make sure that the food that we're making is as delicious as possible. There's unprecedented growth in this industry. Global plant-based milk sales is going to be 34 billion by 2022. This is huge. Now, how many times do you, have you been to the grocery store lately and just looked at the milk case? It's about 40% plant-based milks now. This was unimaginable 10 years ago. In terms of plant-based meats, it's going to be six billion dollars in just a few more years. So we're talking about the Impossible Burger, um, Beyond Meat, uh, etc. And plant-based cheese is four billion dollars. Now I can tell you because I'm in the plant-based cheese field right now, and four billion dollars in six years is almost unthinkable because the entire global industry for plant-based cheese is less than a billion dollars right now. So this is over a quadruple increase in just six short years, um, which is amazing. So these are just some of the fastest growing terms, vegan and plant-based almond milk sustainable, growing at over 100% a year versus things like vegetarian, which are only growing at 6%. Now this is an old slide and I'm, I'm afraid, okay, so this is a Mac and PC problem. I did this on a PC and I'm afraid the numbers aren't showing up here on the Mac. So you, you have no idea what you're looking at. So. <laughs> But basically, the top line, the orange line, is plant-based cheese, and the blue line is dairy cheese. So this comes from a market research company called Spins. And this is actually an old slide, so it, it's probably good that the numbers aren't there, because this actually showed the figures through January, uh, year over year, of 2018, compared to the previous year. And, um, I just saw the new figures just on Thursday, and it's even higher. Plant-based cheese is growing at 40% now. 40%. That is huge. Uh, yes, so, so that's really what it's about. So that's how we're going to get to $4 billion by 2022, by, by outperforming other uh, dairy products. Now, they also have figures on all dairy cheeses sold in the natural channel. In other words, in natural food stores. And it's over 700 brands. So this is dairy cheese and non-dairy cheese. Miyoko's Creamery, Miyoko's is now in the top 10 out of 700. In other words, yes. But it, it gets better than that. It gets better than that because there's actually three plant-based brands in the top 10 of all cheese and that's Dea, Follow Your Heart, and Miyoko's. This is amazing. This was unthinkable 10 years ago. All right, I don't know, I hope these other slides show. The same thing is in vegan ice cream, 53% growth. This is what people are buying, vegan ice cream. Have you seen the set lately? How many new brands are coming out? 
and it's all plant-based and everyone's getting in on it. Whether, you know, it's Ben and Jerry's and Haagen-Dazs, everyone is making vegan ice cream because it's outselling the dairy ice cream. Now, everyone's taking attention. Everyone now is noticing what's going on in plant-based, including Meat and Poultry Magazine says that the future of meat alternatives looks very bright. All right. And Baum and Whiteman, which does trend research for, uh, for the restaurant industry, says that 2018 is the year of vegan. And more steakhouses are now introducing vegan options because uh, people, you know, they're turning away customers who are like, hey, I'm the vegetarian, I don't want to go to that steakhouse. But if they have a vegan option, they'll bring, it, they'll bring it in. So one of the most effective things we can do is go into restaurants that are not vegan and request vegan. Bring in a big group and say, hey, we'll come here every single month. If you pr put vegan items on the menu, that's a really effective form of activism, more so than telling them how bad they are. We want to encourage, we want to provide solutions. Take the recipes, you know, take recipes that you can help them uh, transition with. All right, meat leaders are now investing in plant-based. I think probably a lot of people know that Tyson has actually bought a fairly significant amount of Beyond Meat. And, and the president of Tyson actually says, hey, this may be the future. So there's a lot of investments now that are going into plant-based companies. Um, you know, many of the, the plant-based meat companies now are funded by meat companies. So we've got uh, Danone bought Silk White Wave. Tyson invested in Beyond Meat. Maple Leaf, which is a sausage maker in Canada, bought up Light Life and Field Roast, and Nestle bought Sweet Earth, which makes seitan. Now, I know there was a lot of, um, a lot of vegans were really upset when Dea was bought by Otsuka, this pharmaceutical company. You guys remember that? There was a lot of people saying, I'm never, ever, ever going to buy Dea again. And that's fine, that's your prerogative. And if you want to just shop at the farmer's market, that's also your prerogative. But we are not in that, we're not there yet. We're not at a point where we can, you know, plant-based companies, it doesn't matter, in, in terms of the industry, you have to find some sort of exit strategy. You have to find some way to become mainstream. And in order to become mainstream, sometimes you have to take in big bucks because there is no multi-billion dollar plant-based company right now. We're going to get there because all of these companies like Tyson and Nestle and Maple Leaf will eventually, just like the horse and buggy, become obsolete and their products will switch over to plant-based, but they have to start somewhere. So there's going to be a little gray period that may make you feel uncomfortable, but there's a reason for that. We're gonna to have to get through this phase, and I really do believe in 10 to 20 years, the majority of large companies in this world will be making plant-based proteins. All right, well, we've gotten the attention of the meat and dairy industry, and this article came out about, you know, eight great business people that are doing a lot to uh, close slaughterhouses for good. And this was, of course, a positive spin, and Bill Gates was there, and I was really honored to be listed in this. But then, Beef Magazine, this is one of the most dubious honors I have ever had. Um, but I got a... I got a shout out from Beef Magazine as one of the eight business moguls, which I'm not, trying to put you out of business. All right. So, okay. We can laugh about that here, but it's actually kind of a serious problem, uh, you know, and, and it's really sort of like, um, I was at, um, at Circle V last year and Bruce Friedrich of, of um, of New Crop, I'm not New, of uh, Good Food Institute was talking about how they were going to have this convention in New York City back in the early 20th century about what to do with all of horse manure. There was just a ton load of shit and they didn't know what to do about it. And all these people came from all over the world to discuss this problem and, and they couldn't figure out what sort of technology would most remove all this manure. Well, it became completely, that whole conference was obsolete because two years later, Henry Ford introduced the automobile. And the horse and buggy went away. 
And so they no longer needed to solve that problem. And this is exactly what's happening right now. And it's like the horse and buggy. People are very, very threatened. So this brings us to the hurdles that we have. Now, normally you'd want to have hurdles and, and, and solutions. But I decided that a hurdle is a solution. A hurdle is designed to make you jump higher so you become stronger, so you can run faster, and we can make more of an impact and make more of a change. So the hurdle is the solution, and we do have these hurdles. And one of them is, you know, what almond milk is doing to the dairy industry. Well, all kinds of things are happening. Animal, cows are being killed, milk is being dumped, and um, dairy farmers are running scared. They don't know what to do. In fact, in New York State right now, they have the highest rate of suicides among dairy farmers. Now, I'm not showing this to you because I think it's funny. I'm showing this to you because it's really serious. It's a lot more serious than you know the ton of shit in New York City at the turn of the century. This is a serious problem, and this is one of the backlashes that vegan companies are getting right now. Uh, there are bills that are being introduced about that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. And, and people are, I feel like we have to be compassionate towards the farmers. I live in ag country. I live in West Marin, where I have an animal sanctuary called Rancho Compasión. Please visit our table back there. Um, and by the way, we have volunteer work days and we have visitation days on the second Saturday of each month that we're starting this month for the first time. So you can find all about that at, back there at the table. And also be sure to try some of our new cream cheeses that we're featuring back there at Miyoko's Kitchen. Um, but so I live in ag country where there used to be about 150 dairies at the turn of the century in Marin, West Marin, and now they're down to 12. And they are running scared. They're running for their lives. Uh, most of these ranchers lease land from uh, public lands, from the park services. And right now, the park services is trying to decide what to do because these 30-year leases are expiring. And the question is, do we extend the leases to the ranchers and let dairy ranching continue in Point Reyes National Seashore? Or do we not do that? And then there's the issue of all the elk. What do we do with all the elk that the ranchers don't like? Because the, the elk are encroaching on their lands, uh, eating the competing for the grass that the, the, the cows need. And so should we, how do we manage the elk? Do we exterminate them like we did the white deer about seven years ago? We, did, we killed all the white deer in Point Reyes National Seashore a few years ago. So do we do that with the elk? Or do we decide to you know, let the ranchers say bye-bye and, and say goodbye to the ranchers and let the elk live? What should we do? And there's a huge debate going on. And the politicians are largely in favor of letting ranching continue because this is the agricultural tradition. Now, I have a cow named Angel who was rescued from a dairy farm that shut down. And she was the last cow there. She was three months old when she came to live with us. And the rancher was going to take her to auction, but a vegan talked him into letting her come and live her, the rest of her life at a sanctuary. And she's, because she was just a little, little tiny sweet cow when she came. She's been spoiled rotten, and she's a major big time annoying diva, but we love her just the same. But anyway, when I was talking to this rancher, this farmer who was 75 years old and retiring, he said, I've been wanting to retire for years, but I have to keep feeding America. And this is the belief. I know this, is, this sounds, um, you know, it sounds unbelievable to a lot of vegans, but seriously, this is how a lot of ranchers and farmers think. They're not doing it because they think they're evil. They believe they are doing the right thing. They're feeding America. And so we need to do something to help them transition because this is the only livelihood they know. It's a serious problem. And one of the things that we can help them to transition is someone like this guy. Do you guys know about Elmhurst? This is a 90-year-old New York dairy that finally saw the writing on the wall. And the CEO went vegan and he decided, you know what, dairy is down, why are we dumping milk? Let's make nut milk instead. And now business is booming. So these are the kind of solutions, yes.
Or here's another idea. They could just go into the pop business now that it's legal in California, right? But seriously, there's actually an organization, and I couldn't get the graphic up in time, so I'm sorry about this, but there's an organization. Um, it's, a, it's, from, it's based in, um, in Europe, and it's these wealthy philanthropists, vegan philanthropists in Europe that put together a nonprofit that is working with ranchers and farmers to convert their farms to crops, paying them to do this so that they won't lose a life, their livelihood. So this is the kind of thing we need to come up with more and more solutions to help people, to empower them so they can make the transition, so they don't feel like they're being stepped upon. Here's a bill in Congress uh, put out by uh, Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin. It's called the Dairy Pride Act. I can't believe she's a Democrat, but anyway. So there's something called the Standards of Identity, which says what you can call uh, foods, you know, what, the proper labeling for foods, and it's to prevent confusion in the marketplace. So milk and cheese are defined as the lacteal secretions of one or more healthy cows. So actually, technically, goat cheese would not be allowed to be called cheese either. Uh, and I guess, you know, mother's milk, that's not milk either, because I'm not a cow. Um, but the FDA actually doesn't have the power to, to enforce these standards of identity. So this bill would require the FDA to enforce the standards of identity so that I cannot call my cheese cheese. And Dea would not be able to say cheddar style slices, etc. cetera. Um, and now it gets even worse because there is a bill in Missouri that's trying to stop meat uh, it's, whether it's beyond meat, you know, it's, it's plant-based meat or cellular agricultural meat from being called meat. So there is, there's a lot of people in the incumbent industries that are scared and that are trying to push regulation that would hamper plant-based companies. Uh, plant-based companies already do not have an equal playing field. We don't get the subsidies that meat and, agri uh, meat and dairy get from the government in terms of um, the subsidies for, for our products as well as the checkoff programs, which are these mandatory advertising campaigns that come up with phrases like, got milk or, or, or uh, beef, it's what's for dinner. Um, we don't have the advantage of these, these uh, programs. And so we put together something called the Plant-Based Foods Association, which is the first trade association to represent the plant-based industry. And it was founded by Michelle Simon, who's a, a vegan activist, lawyer, um, and these other great people from companies uh, such as uh, Michael Lynch of Dea, um, Martin Kruger of Follow Your Heart, um, Jamie Athos of Tofurky, and Doug of Good Karma. Um, and so what we're trying to do is create an equal playing field for plant-based companies. Um, and we're working on things like the standards of identity, trying to come up with our own standard of identity so that all vegan cheese products, for example, are called by the same name. When I was told, when I started four years ago and I was told by the California Department of Food and Agriculture that I could not put cheese on my package or my social media or my website, I said, well, what am I gonna call my product then? And they said, I don't know, it's your company, you tell me what you're gonna call it. And so I had to think real fast, and I said, uh, uh, um, a cultured nut product. And she said, okay, cultured nut product, that is, there it is. And that's how my earlier packaging uh, came to have cultured nut product on it. But what the hell is cultured nut product? <laughs> Who the hell knows? What shopper goes into a grocery store and says, where are the cultured nut products? I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. The standards of identity are, were created to, to uh, prevent confusion in the marketplace. But if innovative companies are left to their own devices to come up with their own nomenclature, it's actually going to create even more confusion in the marketplace. Because we may all be making plant-based milks or plant-based cheese. But if we're calling them by different names, people are like, well, is this, is this, what's the difference between milk and beverage? Or what's the difference between, you, you know what I'm talking about? And so, we all need to be on the same page. We need new regulation. The fact is, all these new products, all this innovation, no one's ever done this before. We don't know how to talk about it because we are reinventing the foodscape. 
And so we need to learn how to have this conversation with not only regulators, but consumers, so there is a mutual understanding of what's going on. Um, it's a really exciting but challenging time. So let's talk a little bit about investment. What's going on? How much money is there? Well, there's over $2 trillion going into plant-based companies. That's how much money there is. In fact, there is even more. I believe this figure is closer to $3 million. And we're talking about a consortium of investors who are targeting companies and saying, hey, we want you to make more plant-based products. That's that meat is not the future, milk is not the future, we want plant-based proteins. We have, there's a whole slate of new venture capitalists, private equity, and family offices that are now investing only in plant-based companies. Now, they like to use the word plant-based, I like to use the word vegan, but out of respect for them. Um, uh, so there's so much money now going into vegan companies. And it's not just food. We're talking about vegan fashion. We're talking about, uh, you know, whatever it is, with vegan beauty products. Food is definitely leading the charge, but there's so much money going into all of these uh, vegan businesses now. It's very, very exciting. So let's just look at all of these proteins that are coming out. Um, and some of these players that are investing in all of these different companies. Um, and it's just increasing more and more. A lot of it is, is from a philanthropic, philanthropic angle, but many of them are seeing higher returns because plant-based companies are outpacing the incumbent industries in terms of growth. And they're growing at triple digit figures year after year as we are. Um, showing that their, their, their ROI is going to be so much greater. So while, just like Tyson or these, these uh, bigger CPG companies, I'm sorry, CPG is computer, uh, consumer packaged good companies that are, in, uh, that are buying up plant-based companies, uh, startups and early stage companies, these bigger investors are now, whether or not they're vegan themselves, just like these protein technologists that I just met with last week, they're seeing the writing on the wall, and they are seeing the future isn't vegan. And there is not a lot of money going into other businesses, which is really, really exciting. So this is how the dairy landscape looks like. Once again, um, lots and lots of investors. And it looks like there is a, there's a section missing there. I'm not sure what happened there. Ah, cheese, cashew, Miyoko's, there it is. Um, but actually, you know, a lot of people ask me, what do you think about your competition? I think it's great. In fact, they're not my competition. They're my collaborators. Because you saw that slide earlier, three doors of vegan cheese. You think one brand can have three doors? No. We need as many brands as possible filling up the space, because if we don't, we'll never become mainstream. We need more vegan cheese companies. We need more vegan meat companies. We need more vegan everything, so that we can become more visible, we can get bigger billboard space, we can expand the category together. This is something that we do together. It's not any one single company, and it's not any one single individual, and it's not The future is in tackling the bigger competitor, which of course is meat and dairy. So how can you guys help out? What is the best form of activism? Even if you don't have a business, what can you do to provide solutions? Because a lot of these, all of these companies, whether it's a vegan company or Tyson, even Tyson is now a solution provider because they've invested in plant-based companies. So you can learn to make brownies and share with your neighbor. Learn to cook, invite your relatives, host Thanksgiving. How many of you no longer go to Thanksgiving if it's serving meat? Okay, I'm gonna ask you to reconsider that. So years ago, when I first went vegan, um, or actually when I went vegetarian at the age of 12, um, well, when I learned to cook in my early 20s, I just decided, you know what, I don't want to have 
I don't want to be seeing Turkey. So I found a solution, which was to become the host. And I started inviting everyone to my house. And I learned to make the most delicious food possible. In fact, earlier, I think you saw a picture of my UnTurkey, which was my first company back in the 1990s. I had a company called Now and Zen. We made a product called the UnTurkey, which was the second leading turkey alternative in the country after Tofurkey. Um, but anyway, so, you know, this is what I did. But today, I urge you, share a meal with an omnivore. But just make sure your dish is tastier than theirs. So everybody wants it. That's really what we have to do. We can't continue to live in a vegan bubble. It feels great. It feels safe. But how are we going to be solution providers to the rest of the world if we're estranging ourselves from it, if we're withdrawing from the world? We have to become the ambassador. We have to all work together just like, you know, with the meat companies. The plant-based companies have to work with the, the non-animal, the, the non-vegan companies in order to advance, and we have to do the same. You don't have to sacrifice your principles. Just start making better food, because that's all people want. All they want is something that tastes good, and if you can deliver that, no one really cares what it's made out of. Do you think anyone really cares that the Impossible Burger isn't meat? No, most people don't care. They just care that it's tasty. And the majority of, of the people that are eating the Impossible Burger are omnivores. They're not vegans. So it's, it's really quite exciting. You also have that opportunity. You can always take Miyoko's cheese to your next dinner party. Uh, and you can also tell animal stories. People love animal stories. And then there's great movies like, have you heard of What the Health? How many people? I can't tell you how many people I meet who say, uh, you know, I tell them I'm vegan and they're like, because I tell everyone I'm vegan. You guys all know that joke, right? Yeah. About a CrossFitter, an atheist, and a vegan went into a bar. How do you know? They tell you. And so, you know, we're always telling everyone, oh, no, no, I'm vegan, you know. Um, but, we, but we have to do that proudly instead of apologetically. But, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've told people I'm vegan. They're, go, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I just saw this movie called What the Hell. I mean, that is getting a heck of a lot of traction. It is absolutely amazing. I think it's one of the biggest movers out there in terms of getting people to transition. So laugh, smile, participate, cheerlead. Be the phenomenally proud vegan in your community. Don't shy away from the community. I live in ag land. I associate with ranchers and farmers every single day. And the ladies auxiliary asked me recently in Nicasio, where I live, to do another vegan cooking demo. So get out there. Tell everyone you're vegan and that you're vegan and you're proud. Now, I'm gonna, I always like to end things with a little story. So I'm going to tell you about Erica, the defiant cow, at my sanctuary at Rancho Compasión in Nicasio. And Erica was a dairy cow who was going to be slaughtered for a hamburger because she had arthritis and couldn't stand. Um, and so she was being sold in, in Sonoma County. And another vegan happened to uh, find out about Erica and managed to rescue Erica and um, gave her a lot of love. And then, you know, the, the, this other vegan has a small micro sanctuary, but she didn't have a place for a cow. And she was just standing in, in, this, in this sort of muddy pit in the winter. And, and she said, you know, I'm so afraid she's gonna slip and fall. She has arthritis, she's not able to stand up. Can you please take her? And so we took her. And I, you know, I'm a, novel, I'm a novice sanctuary owner, right? So I, I mean, I don't have a degree in, in animal husbandry or anything like that. And I've just kind of learned how to do this um, in the last two and a half years since we've had Rancho Compasión. And now we're up to about 70 animals. But, but when Erica came, I was really, really afraid. I thought, how are we gonna get her off of a trailer? How is she, you know, what am I gonna do if she falls down? And we opened up the trailer. She saw the green grass. She ran off the trailer, and she has not stopped running since. That cow, Erica. Erica did not have arthritis. She had depression. 
She was having a sit-down protest at that dairy because she did not want to endure the slavery and the artificial insemination and having her baby taken away and seeing everything that she saw around her. Cows are so intuitive. They are so smart. And Erica wanted none of that. So she did the best thing she possibly could, which was to just sit down and not get up. And that saved her life. Now Erica lives a happy life along with Angel at Rancho Compasión, where she gets to frolic and run down the hill. Would an arthritic cow be able to do that? Seriously. This is the future. We need to move to a brighter, better future. And in order to do that, we need to become the positive, proud, spirited cheerleaders of the vegan movement. We need to become phenomenally vegan. And I hope you'll all join me in going into our communities and talking to as many people as possible and letting them know about the opportunity, the possibilities, the excitement of what we're doing. Thank you very much. So, um, do we have time for question and answers, or should I just go back there? Maybe, no. <laughs> for, uh, no. Maybe okay. on the panel. If you okay, we'll have question and answer on the panel, and I'll be at the booth at either Rancho Compassion or uh, Bioco, so please come by. And uh, by the way, we have raffle tickets at, uh, for a $100 gift basket from Miyoko's. Uh The raffle is a fundraiser for Rancho Compassion, so uh, please check us out. Thank you. Thank you so much.